Hey, everybody, and welcome to DC's Read with the Lights On panel. Uh, I've got a bunch of amazing creators here for DC, and we are all here to talk about horror and about scary stuff. And so I am more than honored and completely humbled by the talent that we have joining us today. So I'm going to go around a little bit and let them introduce themselves. Uh, we can start with, with Bill. Hi, good to see you, Katie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be part of the panel. Um, I'm Bill Sinkevich, uh, uh, and uh, I'm so incredibly fortunate to be working on the covers for the Conjuring series, um, and uh, I'm having a blast. The issues are scary, and uh, I do I, I read them with the lights on um, because uh, you know I, I I also since I'm doing the covers, that's also helpful to keep the lights on. <laughs> So, but uh, thanks for having me as part of the panel. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and part of the team. And Yay. also, it's great. It's great to meet everybody else. I mean, I, I, you know, it's been we've all been in lockdown, so getting to actually see colleagues and people, I'm, you know, we're actually working working together. Uh, you know, this is this is a, a nice uh, uh, sort of interim thing until we actually get back to being around people again. So, so that's true. You know, that's yeah. true. Well, I, um, I'm happy to then introduce you visually to, to David, and uh, uh, who is, is our writer for Conjuring the Lover. And, and David, why don't you go ahead and, I guess I kind of introduced you already, but you, you're better. Yeah. No, I, I'm David Johnson McGoldrick. Uh, I'm uh, the screenwriter from Conjuring 2, and I also wrote uh, Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It. And uh, this is my first co comic book. So as a horror fan and a horror comic fi fan specifically, I'm so excited to have, uh, to, to be involved with this. We're happy. We're happy to have you. And I know that we've, we've paired you up with an amazing co-writer in Mr. Rex Ogle, and I'm happy he could join us there here today. Rex, why don't you do a cute little intro? <laughs> Howdy folks, I'm Rex Ogle. I'm the co-writer on Conjuring the Lover, a uh, huge horror movie fan and uh, very excited to be working on this. I'm excited to have you too. You're, you are, guys are killing it, killing it for me. Uh, and we are also super jazzed to have Matt Rosenberg here. Uh, he is going to be uh, writing a couple of uh, upcoming comics for us. And so uh, Matt, I will let you introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, honored to be here with all of you and everyone at home watching. And uh, yeah, I'm writing uh, Task Force Z and I am writing a book called DC versus Vampires, which I'm co-writing with uh, Mr. James Tynan. Speaking of James, since he's unable to join us on the panel, he was gracious enough to answer some of our questions and send in this awesome video for all the fans to see. Hey everyone, my name is James Tynan IV. I am the writer of many titles, including Batman, Joker, but I think the big one we're going to be talking a lot about today is The Nice House on the Lake. Uh, this is the DC Read with the Lights On panel. I'm very sorry that I am not able to attend live with the other panelists, uh, but I, I decided that I would still, I still wanted to uh, pull this video together so I could. Uh, answer all of the questions that that were prepared so uh yeah i could talk a bit about my books and talk a bit about uh what freaks me out and why i love horror so much as a genre uh so yeah let's dig right in so the first question that i was sent is nice house starts with a flash forward or is it a flashback why did you decide to begin the story here as opposed to the chronological start of this narrative uh that's a great question honestly uh, the the big thing that uh, the big influence there um, was the the movie Cape Fear, uh, which starts with this great uh, great. Sh it's very short, but it's only like a few sentences long. But it starts with Juliette Lewis just speaking directly to the camera, uh, and it just sets the sets the tone so perfectly. Uh, and I watched that movie Cape Fear while I was uh, developing the book, and I just realized like. Oh, I, like I kind of really want to capture that feel right at the start of things because, you know, so much of this book, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't handhold you uh, through what's really going to happen next. So a lot of it is about 
uh, really establishing tone and setting tone. So, and I knew I wanted to start with uh, the one of the characters speaking directly to the camera, to the reader, and kind of uh, creating a grounding for the story. And we're going to see that uh, story technique continue uh, issue by issue of the series until you know the when we shake it all up a little bit down the road. But uh, you know, it, it really was about setting tone and telling people what they can expect without telling them what they can expect. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, you know, and I think Alvaro did such an incredible job with it that uh, I'm really, really glad we made that decision. All right, so second question is, how did you choose the players for this world? And how do you hope to buck the horror stereotypes they so clearly establish as members of this house? So uh, that, that's a really great question. And, uh, you know, there's it, it's funny, like right now, like the nice house on the lake is a series with a lot of mysteries. And so many of those mysteries, like we've just uncovered in that first issue, one of the big mysteries uh, and I'm not going to spoil it here on the panel, but if you haven't read Nice House on the Lake, number one, it ends with a big cliffhanger that sets the stage for the entire series. And it is a series that there are going to be more mysteries as the book progresses. Uh, you know, one thing I was talking about this in an interview that one of the big influences on Nice House on the Lake is Lost, which I absolutely loved when I was, uh, you know, when I was in high school and uh, early college and was just one of my favorite uh, pieces of geek media at the time uh, and media in general. So, you know, the, so it's funny that, like, how do I want to buck the stereotypes? I have a very clear answer to that that won't be revealed until the end of issue four. Uh, that is, you know, because so much of this this sort of genre is, like, kind of about picking the characters off one by one and all that stuff but this isn't that sort of story it's much more about uh what happens to human relationships and how humans live with their fear and uh try to cope uh with something so much bigger than them happening uh and how that changes relationships and how that strengthens them in some ways uh, so, yeah, and then for how I chose the characters, honestly, like, and I've said this before in interviews, so many of these characters are based on friends from my real life, and uh, the villain of the series, Walter, is 100% based on me, uh, and it's a, tr it's a trick I've used in the past where I've basically, you know, turned myself into a villain of the story. I did it back uh, in the woods uh, when I was, uh, you know, writing that at Boom Studios a few years ago. And uh, I'm doing it again here, and I love it. Uh, it creates a great shorthand where it's just like, all right, I'm going to lay out all of the ways in which I'm uh, a monster that needs to be stopped. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully people enjoy me working my shit out on the page. Uh, next question. You and Matt are working on DC versus vampires. What is it about the vampire genre that sets your teeth on edge? Pun intended. Oh boy. Uh, well, honestly, I've, I've loved vampires my entire life. There is something so, like, both seductive and terrifying about it. And it is, there is so much power in, like, it, it's so, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this question. But there are. There is something so captivating about vampire stories. Uh, I know for me, like, I, I was always really drawn towards the story of Dracula. Uh, but in my teenage years, I was particularly drawn to the work of Anne Rice and the Vampire Chronicles. And those really made me fall in love uh, with the vampire genre. And then bringing my love of the vampire genre into comics, like, it's no secret that my uh, mentor in the comics industry was Scott Snyder, and American Vampire is still maybe my favorite work he's ever done. Uh, you know, vampires are, you know, they speak to humanity's worst instincts and some of our, some of the instincts that we know are bad, but that we want more than anything. That kind of power, that seductive power 
and the you know and the strength that it brings and but even though we know it's wrong so there's something that we're always drawn towards them and pushed away by them uh and you know this story is one that i'm really excited about uh you know i've, I've talked publicly about how when i when i came on to the batman title uh i honestly wasn't sure like i, I was really only brought on initially till issue 100. That was going to be sort of my big swan song. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to be writing next at DC Comics. And so I, you know, but I was really enjoying working with Ben Abernathy. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to write you a pitch. Uh, and I wrote up a pitch that became DC versus vampires. And I think the initial pitch, it was just DC vampires. I was like, you know, just sort of get getting right to right to the uh, jugular with it, uh, but it was you know the thing that excited me the most was the idea of taking the full tapestry of the DC universe and building a dangerous conspiracy and mystery that's building that the heroes can't see, uh, and then just basically building up a vampire apocalypse that's building issue by issue here and seeing how the heroes. Uh, grow and adapt in the face of that uh, in the face of that horror and uh, you know but then uh, so I was really excited I wrote out this whole uh, big 12 issue outline with like big key beats that I was really really excited about uh, and then I found out like the amazing news that hey they really like your Batman and you're gonna stay on Batman and it's selling really well uh, and I was like, but I was so excited about this vampire story. How I, I can't just give up this vampire story. Uh, and thankfully, uh, Ben was very much on board and I was just like, all right, I'm going to reach out to my friend, Matt Rosenberg, who I'm sure is saying very mean things about me on this panel, uh, and see like, would he have any interest in working on this with me and, and really, you know, doing it justice. Uh, because I, I felt like there was there was some real meat on the bones of the idea, uh, and uh, you know I didn't I didn't want it to I didn't want to I didn't want it to come out unless I could make it come out right, and I knew Matt would bring the exact spirit to the book that it needed, uh, and then on top of that, uh, I had absolutely loved the work that Matt did with Otto Schmidt on uh, Hawkeye Freefall, and I had loved. Otto's work for years and years and years so I was just like okay can we get Matt and can we get Otto and can we just make this the best possible book it can be and thankfully everyone said yes and now it's going to start coming out and I am so so excited this is a big story it's sort of you know not not ex similar to how deceased work it's not exactly it's not core continuity DCU uh, which means that we can go all out None of the characters that you think need to be safe are safe, uh, and you were going to see some, some, some heroes step up to the moment, some fall away, uh, and we're going to see a lot of people change uh, into really frightening monsters. And uh, I'm really, really excited about it. So, yeah. Uh, the the only other thing that I have to say here is, uh, you know, I just want to give an extra shout out to the entire incredible creative team of The Nice House on the Lake. Uh, you know, I, I'm working with Alvaro Martinez Bueno, who I started working with back on the first Batman Eternal, and then again in Batman and Robin Eternal, and then on Detective Comics, and then now, and then Justice League Dark, and now Nice House on the Lake. And, uh, you know, I think this is the best work of his career. And I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of this story. And then on top of that, we're working with uh, Jordi Belair, who just brought such incredible life to every single page, and uh, the incredible people at And World Design, uh, who without, you know, if you've read the first issue, you know the Twitter sequence, and that was a sequence that either would hit or it was going to totally fall flat on its face. And... It hitting is entirely the work of the and world design team so I'm so grateful to them uh, and yeah no I'm just really really happy that uh, there is a place to tell some really scary stories at DC Comics right now and I know that there's a lot more cool stuff to come so 
Uh, I, I think I've been rambling on long enough. Thank you so much for having me and enjoy the rest of the panel. So I just also wanted to thank uh, James Tynan for dropping in and giving us a little message about Nice House on the Lake, which is an amazing, amazing book. I cannot wait for everyone to read it and freak out because it's so good. And also uh, speaking a bit about his book, DC versus Vampires, that he's co-writing with Matt Rosenberg. So thank you so much, James, for joining us. And I wanted to just get us started real quick because, you know, I've spoken individually with most of you at least like some point in our lives about what giant horror nerds we are. And, um, you know, while it's not a new genre for DC, it's definitely at a cultural fever pitch. So, you know, as leaders in this space, what are some of your favorite horror stories and inspirations for the work that you're doing, both of that you've done in the past, because none of you are new to the genre um, creatively. And uh, yeah, what, what just like, what stuff do you, do you dig on? What do you draw from? I guess whoever wants to start. I'll go first. Uh, I actually am a huge horror fan from like early, early on. I was reading uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Bram Stoker's Dracula when I was in middle school. Um, probably way too young for that. And I very quickly graduated to Anne Rice novels, which uh, were definitely above my pay grade. Um, everything from the vampire to the witches. I mean, anything that would scare the socks off of me was something that I was reading. Um, and of course, a huge horror movie fan. I was definitely like, I remember getting up when I was in like second, third grade, I would go to bed early Friday and Saturday nights and I'd wake up at two or 3 AM so that I could watch horror movies that were on like late night television. Um, and they definitely scarred me as a child and left me with the love for more horror. That should have been my question is like, what has scarred you from the horror genre but uh yeah, matt what what kind of uh what kind of stuff do you do because oh you know horror is such like a it's got so many like sub genres within the genre so like yeah what kind of stuff do you do you draw from yeah you know i uh like rex um like i as a little kid i was really into horror and sort of always loved horror uh stuff and that was a big thing me and me and my friends would always like rent horror movies and watch horror movies on sleepovers and I sort of moved away from horror for a while and was kind of like, oh, I, you know, you hit a point where you're like outgrow the stuff you were into when you were little. And I was like, I'm too cool for horror. And then I feel like in the last, like, I, I'm, I'm going to pick a time and everyone's going to be like, oh, it's longer than that or shorter than that. But I feel like in the last like decade, especially, there's been a real renaissance of like really smart sort of independent art house horror films. And, and those have really like sort of, drawn me back in and sort of made me re-examine a lot of like my early influences and stuff. And, you know, like I love, you know, like The Shining is one of my all time favorite films. And obviously like, you know, I, I'm a big Stephen King fan and all that stuff, but, but I really love the new, the new breed of horror directors who are, who are making stuff is really like, I, I think we're seeing now a lot of chances to like take the genre and once again, sort of explore it, take it in different directions where you can put it on, different things and add different elements. And I think that's really fun. And that, so that's something that's a really big sort of influence for me. For sure, for uh, sure. Um, yeah, for me, well, for me, I, I think I sort of dove into every arena of, of horror that I could think of. Um, you know, even, even odd things that people might not think of. Like I remember uh, growing up uh, once a year, they would show The Wizard of Oz on TV. And there was the one scene where, where she, Picks the uh, Dorothy picks the apple and the tree, you know, sort of goes after her. And I just remember like that horror was sort of something that could be everywhere in, in, in other films as well. I mean, I was a big Stephen King fan. Um, uh, definitely uh, when I first when I saw The Exorcist as a, as a, a young teenager um, and having grown up uh, being raised with you know, Catholicism, it's like that movie was like a documentary horror, you know. Of course, The Shining to me is is my one of I think my probably my all time favorite horror film. But um, but I was really big also into Japanese horror. I mean, you know, films like you know like the uh, the Cure. You know, or not not the group, but there was a movie called The Cure. Um, and uh, you know, Tetsuo. You know, the Iron Man. And and um, uh, but what, one of the things I find interesting about horror, and I don't want to take up everybody's time, but is but what's interesting about what we're doing, you know right now with DC and uh, Conjuring the Lover, 
um, is, uh, you know, there's, there's the monster movies and the horror because, you know, th that you see like, you know, Friday the 13th or, or any of those kinds of horror films. And then um, to me, I've always found the setting of a reality and then the creepiness, you know, like uh, the ring, you know, the, the original version and then also the Gore Verbinski version. Uh, which was which was absolutely fascinating. So the idea of um, horror, and I think some who was it that said that horror is the expectation of of uh, or is it terror? I'm I'm, figuring, I'm blanking on what the difference between the two are, but um, uh, but the uh, the one of the things I love about what's being done now, especially with with the resurgence of horror, um, is, and like with Bloomhouse and other you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, forays into into a new a new iteration. The idea that um, uh, they're so indicative of the time that we're in, you know, and I find it really fascinating what what is being done now. So um, the idea of the psychological aspects of it and what's not being seen um, is really really exciting. So um, uh, you know, and certainly the Conjuring when I saw the, those uh, films. Um, you know, it, it amped up, you know, things quite a bit in terms of, of uh, uh, where things are going. And I really, I really enjoy it. I think, uh, you know, looking at horror, especially if you examine like is when you're looking at films specifically, but also like uh, across different mediums and you look at like what stories were coming out of, you know, the 20s and the 30s. And then you go through, you know, 40s, 50s and like all through time and you see how it evolves to scare people. I think that's uh, an extremely good point. And it gives us a bit more insight into David's brain <laughs> as, as someone who's been, been writing some of the conjuring films as well. So like David, like, what do you, what do you think about that? And what kind of inspiration do you draw from as, as someone who has been one of those creators of the cultural touchstones? Well, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, I agree that, that, um, you know, a horror, um, kind of uh, is different from other genres, at least in, in, in my mind, in that um, you you can detect uh, very clear cycles within within the in, within the subgenres. Uh, you know, which is why, like, I am like I I'm a horror omnivore. Um, you know, especially like um, you know every October. I like try to fill the month with like horror movies I haven't ever seen. And it's getting, it's so hard, but like just finding like these weird things that you've never heard of or ones that slip through the cracks. And, you know, to me, like sort of being, sort of trying to take these influences from all these places, I think is, is, um, you know, for, for me really important because that horror wheel is always turning. You know, I, I think the thing that um, uh, James Wan did with the first, uh, conjuring film was really to, to, to pay attention to how far the wheel had turned since our last great haunted house movie. Right. Yeah. Cause there, there's a, there's a, cause you had this phase where it's like, it's all this one thing. And we had seen every haunted house. We'd seen every single possible version of a haunted house to the point that you really like, you, it, you know, we were just like, forget about it I've seen everything and it went away for long enough that all this new creative energy could come into and, and fill that space so that you know after all the crazy things that we'd seen of all the you know the 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 Japanese wave of horror and the ring horror and 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 uh you know the the torture porn horror there was then what if there's a house and it has ghosts in it and that was like, oh my God, I can't wait to see this movie. I mean, you know, so it's, you know, and, and that will pass out of vogue and a new thing will come in. But I, you know, I, I'm, I think that's sort of what makes it lasting, you know, is that it's sort of, it's, it's a shapeshifter and, and kind of occupies the, the negative space of whatever our collective psyche happens to be at that time. That's super, super true. Um, and, you know, in my head, I'm just like, I kind of wonder like, what's the next thing that's going to creep people out next as long as it's not like a slew of like plague movies. Um, <laughs> but I, so, so like I'd mentioned you, you all have been in this horror space before uh, or you're, you're super big fans of the, of the genre. And, 
you know, um, Conjuring the Lover and then Task Force Z and also DC versus Vampires are almost three different types of horror within the genre. And I'm super curious as to, as creators, you know, uh, um, Rex and, and David and Matt as, as writers and, and Bill as an artist, how do you scare people with these types of stories? Because, you know, these are comics. They don't have jump scares. They don't have, you know, jump cuts. They don't have things like that. So how do you craft a story both visually and um, with the storytelling to scare readers? Well, if I can jump in as, as some, from the visual end um, uh, first, uh, I certainly uh, agree with everything that everybody has said. And um, uh, I found that, that uh, having gone through like so much of the, the creepy and eerie stuff, re and again, the reading stuff, plus also the, um, like the Stephen King books. I remember, you know, reading The Shining and I, I, I loved everything that K Stephen King had written, but there was one bit that happened in The Shining that I remember uh, stayed with me and was probably the most horrifying aspect of it that, that uh, in the story. There was one scene in the book, which is very different, you know, than the film, obviously, but, um, where Halloran is rescuing Wendy and they go and they, they go into um, he's, I think he's on a, in the snow cat or on the snowmobile or whatever. And he, and he, he, Wendy's been completely beaten up and he's, he's like, he goes in and sees the rope, the croquet mallets or the rope mallets. And he's looking for a blanket to cover her up. And, and Halloran starts thinking that, um, you know, she's, she's not, she might not make it you know, and she's, it's like, and he starts as, as you, as I was reading the paragraph and his, his, his inner monologue, it starts to become like twisted into the point where he starts to justify putting her out of her misery, you know? And I remember stopping and going, if everything that King was writing was about the demons of the overlook or whatever, taking over and sort of twisting your perceptions, to make, to rationalize committing a horror, a, a, an atrocity. I stopped reading at, at that moment. I was like, oh my God, it's like, I actually got, I'm still getting like the hair on my arms is standing up. And um, so for me, the implication or the anticipation or the dread or the suspense, I mean, I've done, you know, plenty of kinds of illustrations that have been about, you know, people getting their, you know, their heads ripped open or whatever. But I, I tend to like what is implied, what is what is not seen. That's one of the things that I think um, certainly Jaws or any other film like that, where you don't see um, or alien or, you know, it's which is basically a haunted house in space, et cetera. Yeah. Et cetera. But the idea that you don't see the reveal um, you know, and that's what I think is sort of coming back amongst a lot of a lot of films and um, is the implication of, of uh, horror. And um, uh, even though we can show everything, there is people do like the jump scares and the big reveals. Um, I find that um, uh, horror in a lot of ways is kind of an intensely personal thing in some ways. I mean, there's a universality to it, but there's also certain things that just feel incredibly creepy and uh, it's like, don't go in there kind of a, uh, you know, of a thing. So um, for me, that's, you know, I, I like the idea of, of pulling back uh, just a bit and letting the viewer or the reader put themselves into the scenario. And um, it's, it's sort of the difference between kinetic energy and, you know, potential energy. It's like potential horror. It's like, I'm not going to show you like the guy getting ripped apart. It's like, I'm going to set the scenario so you can, you can walk in full of dread, you know? And then I feel like I can sit back and go, okay, I've, I've done my job. I, you know? I think you've done an amazing job with that on our covers for the series too, because like, you know, on the first cover, you've got the occultist and she's just, she just looks really like creepy and terrifying. Like you, she's just like, you know, she's standing in, in the artifact room, uh, the Warren's artifact room. And she like, there's just something about her that's off. And you did such a nice job with that, with that image. And then almost like reflecting that similar image with our cover for the second issue uh, with, with Jessica. So like 
job well done. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, no, I'm having, I'm absolutely, I'm having an, an absolutely wonderful time. So thank you. Um, Re- Rex, I would love to hear, uh, you know, on the, on the writing side, how do you, how do you and David, um, write those, those scary moments in the story? Because, uh, you know, you're expanding on, uh, a character in a world that, that David introduced in the film, but then you both are kind of trying to figure out how to show readers those scary moments or those terrifying moments or those moments of dread in the comic, like how, how do you write stuff that scares people? Like, what is your approach to that? I think there's definitely a kind of stylistic element to my approach, which is, it's all about that page turn. You wanna build the dread over two pages and have every panel leading to the next and building dread, building tension, building anxiety, building stress. So that once you get to that page turn, you're like, oh gosh, like you're a little bit shaky. And I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's such a hard thing to do in comparison with like watching the conjuring movie, because like you already have a visual element already set up and it's just, it's leading you, it's pulling you in and it's pulling you in. So, I mean, one of the things I did was I went back and I read a bunch of Junji Ito just to like really kind of beef up because he is such a master of suspense and that's what it is. It's all about building that suspense. And what's, What's really great is I've never done, uh, I've never written with a co-writer before, but David has been amazing at pushing me. And like, I'm like, I think I got it scary. And he's like, no, you can go farther. And so it's, it's really awesome having someone at my back and like helping me to like push it and make it scarier and make it more like the conjuring. David, how's it been, how's it been for you then? Well, I, I'm just relieved to hear that I haven't just completely annoyed him to death yet. Uh, <laughs> Not at all. But no, like it's interesting. I mean, I don't have the experience in, in, in comics, but I mean, just to make an, an analogy, to, I guess, to, to film uh, and, and sort of build off what uh, uh, Bill was saying, you know, is, you know, we can, especially in comic, you can show anything, which is fantastic, but like, it's so important to show the right thing the exact right thing. Um, and, and sort of uh, at, at as an ex- example, I actually have a very similar story to, to Bill's uh, reading Stephen King um, and, and the point where I got to a point where I was just like, I have to put the book down. Um, and it was, a, it's funny, I mean, it's a novel, but it was about finding the exact right image. Um, there's this, the scene in that book where she chops off his foot. And he goes for the big gross out and it's really bad. And I was like, oh my God, this is really gross and, 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 and was freaked out by it. But then as she's leaving, as she's cauterized the wound, she's the just this horrible, grueling thing. I was like, okay, this is bad. I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. As she's leaving with the foot, he notices the scar he got when he was a kid, when he stepped on a piece of glass at the beach and it connects you with like, oh, but that's my foot that's that's the history of my foot walking out that door <laughs> yeah and it then yeah. connects you with the horror and the the and makes it personal and i that was like after all the blood and the gore and and whatever that was the moment where i was like nope i'm done for the night uh i just i couldn't hack it past that but it was finding that exact right thing that connected me personally uh with the gore that that shook me wow that's, totally. that's interesting yeah, I totally, totally get that. And, and, you know, speaking of blood, uh, Matt, uh, you know, you're, you're with, uh, Task Force Z and, uh, and, and, uh, DC versus zombies. I, you know, it's, it's kind of a different approach than, uh, something like conjuring the lover. I mean, if you can, if you can tell us a little bit about how you craft scares for those, those books, because you do have, uh, you know, monsters and uh, you've got a fair amount more blood than than the conjuring comic does so like how do you and 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 you have dc characters as well so how do you take those characters and approach this story to make it to make it scary yeah you know it's it's funny because like uh everything everyone said is 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 true but we uh, on task force c and and dc versus vampires like we have this weird problem that is an opportunity to do something different like because we have superheroes so in in some way like your your first problem of like well horror is very personal and horror is very what scares you and like 
how, how does that work when when Red Hood is there or Batman is there or Green Lantern is there? It becomes a different thing because like you're not going to be afraid. The things that scare them would be incomprehensible to you and the things that scare you wouldn't be scared of them but it also so like you know like like rex said like learning about you know studying the page turns and the junji ito of it all like is definitely true but we had to really uh one thing that i really focused on and it's it's sort of funny because the books on their surface seem very similar it's dc characters as zombies and dc characters as vampires but uh they're sort of two sides of of the same coin which is that like we really tried to focus in on on more of the psychological aspects of the horror for them and and just finding those moments and so a book like Task Force Z is about becoming a monster it's about a personal journey to be like where is the line the moral line where someone becomes a monster and and it's for us it's Jason Todd sort of examining like what what am I doing and and is it okay and where's the line and it becomes this sort of and and you know we have a lot of body horror elements in there and a lot of other stuff and it's it's creepy and you know there's dead man bad and uh, things like that but it a lot of it is a very personal and very introspective for him and and just seeing things that he's done and a part of and and going to be a part of and has to do to survive and and pushing that and and the inverse of that is DC versus vampires which is uh, I mean, it's a story of, of vampires infiltrating the DC superhero community and, and dismantling it. And that is, it's about trust. And it's about, it's about these people that you've known your whole life and, and giving them your trust and, and learning to accept, you know, learning that you can't trust anyone. And, and that's really a, a horrific thing that is very personal to people. The idea that you're on your own and, and, and we're gonna watch as these superhero teams get dismantled from the inside. And, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that has been influential. I know that for DC versus Vampires, like a Tom Taylor's deceased book was a big, like we, me and James sat down and really looked at that. And we're like, he does such a good job with the zombies of this. What is the vampire version of this? How do we, do that. And it, and it comes to a different thing. It comes to less of a, you know, each, each genre, subgenre of horror has its own strengths. And so we're trying to play to those in, in ways. And it's less, you know, it's not the jump scares. It's not the, you know, the, the scary monsters aren't quite as scary as the, the personal relationships are, are what we're playing with. I love that. I love that. In fact, I was like, damn it, he kind of stole the, my next question. Cause I was going to say, I'm like, if you've got zombies and you've got vampires, like how do you bring new life? <laughs> how do you bring new life, uh, you know, to, to these genres and to these, cause you know, these are well-loved monster genres and I, I, you know, people are, familiar with zombies and people are familiar as vampires so i'm like is there anything you can tease readers with of like new things you'll you'll be bringing to those titles or like new things that that maybe they wouldn't have expected to to come especially including the dc superheroes yeah i mean i think i think we're always trying to push what you've seen before i mean i think you know david had a good point of how like the everything reinvents itself and it's all about pushing the wheel and we have this great lane of being like well, we can take things that maybe you've seen other places, but what do they mean? Like, what does it mean if someone, you know, like someone with superpowers, I'm not gonna say who is a vampire. Uh, I want that to be a surprise, but like use your imagination. What would it mean for these people to be vampires? What, what are the, how would they use their powers as vampires? And it becomes, you know, it was a whole, you know, for me and James and when we were writing it, it was a whole thing of like, who, who, do we, who would be the most fun to see fighting a vampire and who would be the most fun to see as a vampire? And like, we have just these grandiose plans to just, you know, like, uh, what does vampire swamp thing look like? What does vampire hunter swamp thing look like? What is vampire green arrow? Like what is vampire hunter green arrow? Like, and it's all just playing with these ideas um, to, to take the normal tropes we've seen and, and just redress them and put costumes on them and see wh where that takes us. And I think it's really fun because it, it pushes horror for us in a fun way, but it also pushes these characters. Like we're really testing who they are and, and you know in, in task force z like jason isn't a zombie he's not dead um but he is someone who came back from the dead and he is with people 
who are dead. And like, it's a very fine line, but it's a fine line that you can explore in comics because you have these opportunities where like people are coming back from the dead and we've brought people back from the dead almost. And so there's, there's this line where he's trying to examine what it means that like, is he a zombie? Like it, on a, on an ethical level, is he a zombie? What is it? You know, he's been dead. What does it mean for him? And so like, those are really fun to play with and, and push and, I, I, I think readers are really going to like how far we take things. Or, I feel, or I feel like it was like, them. no, no, no. I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I could see just the conversation between you and James when you're like, is Jason Todd a zombie? Because he was dead and then he was brought back to life. And I, yeah. I could do it like, that's extremely like relatable. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, and speaking about like, you know, you've got, you've got stuff that, that people don't expect coming and, and uh, horror is such a great place um, to hide like hidden messages or hidden clues or things like that. Uh, David, I, I know you guys had, had done a lot of that in the Conjuring 2 film. And I know you and Rex had planned a few of those like little hidden things um, in the Conjuring. Is there anything you guys can tell us to keep an eye out for? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, when we, uh, you know, all first started talking about uh, what this was going to be, like, what it, what is, what is a Conjuring comic book? I mean, it was kind of the fun thing right, right off the stop, start was like, there's never been one as what, what is that like? Um, and, you know, for me, one of the things that was, it was, uh, you know, I, I wanted to try to bring to it was sort of some sort of nostalgia from my uh, childhood love of horror comics and what, which was like, you know, gold key, uh, uh, twilight zone comics and, 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 uh, you know, the you know, EC horror and the house of mystery and house of secrets, um, was to bring a sort of sense of fun to it. Um, and so, yeah, in the, you know, the, the comics now we have, we have, you know, secret messages to be decoded inside the comic book that, that, you know, will, provide an Easter egg. If you're seeing the film for the first time, a clue about, you know, the, the mystery. Um, it just, it felt like a way to sort of just have a bit of shameless fun with it, uh, which I feel like, you know, uh, was really part of my experience with horror comics when I was a kid was, was just the sort of, you know, it, you could turn a page and you could order a monkey on a ma by mail order. You know, there was, there, there was like weird things going on in comics. Uh, and, and so it felt fun to like, you know, try and imbue this with some of that spirit. I love that. That's, that's perfect. Um, yeah, I'm just hoping readers can, can find what we've hidden and, and uh, you know, it's one of the fun parts of the genre in general. Yeah. Oh, for real. I, I, I think, you know, if the, for the people that are, are sort of into that stuff, it'll, it'll be fun to like, you know, you know, we didn't make it too hard, you know, so it, 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 there, there, there's a set, there'll be a set of sense of satisfaction at the end of it, I think. I hope so. Uh, I, I have... just, uh, just real quick, I was just no, please. in response to what David just said. I mean, I, I think it's interesting and what it sort of in keeping with what everybody is saying is, is um, uh, you know, people love roller coasters. People love scary. I mean, people love to be frightened and, and, you know, and there is a sense of joy in that and to know that they can actually get past it. So the idea of, of bringing some play into it is actually really, you know, appropriate, absolutely appropriate. What, um, so, you know, all of you have, have done a fair amount of work so far on, on these series. Has there been anything that you've either drawn or written um, that like came out of your brain that's just kind of stayed there, whether it's it's something that you wrote and then the image as it was drawn was stuck or like, is there anything that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that came out of my brain uh, and anything that you can kind of tease readers to keep an eye out for? Um, I would say the, uh, you know, without, <clears throat> without saying what it is, people will know when they read the last issue of... Um, DC versus vampires, the, you know, when, when me and James were planning it out, uh, we knew we were going to kill a character in, in the end of the first issue. And uh, we didn't know how, but we were like, well, there's a bunch of ways we can do it. And uh, I sent James this idea and I was like, I know this is too screwed up to do, but like, let's use this as a like conversation starter. And he was like, no, I think that's exactly what we do. And I was like, we can't do that. And he was like, I don't think we can do it either. And then I remember we wrote it. 
I, I just wrote it and then we sent it to Ben Abernathy, our editor. And I was like, hey, so you might want to look at the last couple of pages of this real close. I don't think we can do this. And uh, Ben was like, yeah, I don't think we can do this, but uh, let's find out. And so it went all the way up and, and it was looked at by whoever looks at these things and all these things. And they came back and they're like, yeah, you can do this. And so that was just in the script. And then Otto Schmidt, who's drawing the book and is a, a genius, when he drew it, I was like, I cannot believe, like I, I emailed Ben again to be like, are you sure that we can do this in the book? Because it is really pretty horrifying, but it's, it's my favorite moment so far, for sure. Man, I can't wait to see, because Otto, you're right, is absolutely brilliant. I cannot wait to see what he brings to horror, because, you know, you're, I'm used to seeing him on more uh, either, you know, straight superhero stuff. I know you guys work together on Hawkeye, and, you know, I've worked with him on a bajillion things. So uh, seeing how he brings horror to that particular title is going to be bananas. Yeah, it's awesome. Um yeah, I mean, uh, I, I could ask this for for Rex and and David and and uh, have have you guys seen? So we have Gary Brown doing our our main stories, and then we've been switching it up with the backup stories. Have you guys seen anything that Gary has drawn that you're like, oh my god, I can't believe he did that, or anything that you drew and you're like, Gary just just made it even scarier than I thought. I mean, the good thing is, is that everything that we've written so far, Gary has managed to take to the next level. I mean, comic books are definitely like a team up of sorts. So, you know, we're writing stuff and then he's drawing it and he's taking it to the next level. So it's like, I write something or David writes something, then we push each other, then the editor pushes us, then the artist pushes us, then the color goes in. And it's really cool getting to see that. I think for me, like, you know, the, the main character is a college student and she's having a lot of, she's struggling with the demon possession, which is very much like having panic attacks. And I had panic attacks in college. So I drew from my experience for that. So I will say that writing it was hard, but actually reading the final issue is a little bit, it's like, it literally creeps me out. Like it, it gives me anxiety to read it. So I'm hoping that it gives my readers anxiety too, because I mean, isn't that the greatest part of horror is getting totally freaked out. It's always why I watch it. Cause I just like, like if I can focus on that character's anxiety, then I don't have to think about my own. Well, it's it's funny it, when you were talking about it, like for me, like you were talking about anything that I had worked on that like bothered me. Like, I feel like when I'm writing horror stuff, it's it's all going out, right? Like, it, like it's stuff that's been in my head that is either causing me anxiety or is a, you know, something that scared me. And I was like, this scares me. I'm going to put it in here and that's going to scare someone else now, you know, uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a more like, um, purging experience. Like once I've written it, I'm not scared of it anymore for whatever reason, if that makes sense. I guess the, the only time I ever kind of freaked myself out, um, was writing, um, the beginning of conjuring two, which is about the, the real life Amityville murders. Um, and so, I, I like purposely stayed up late and was like looking at the crime scene photos and was like, this might've been a mistake. Um, but I, I, you know, I put it all, I tried to put it all in the script. I love that. What about you, Bill? Um, well, I find that, uh, you know, there, there've been images that I've done. I mean, I've done, uh, you know, having done like a lot of, a lot of superhero stuff, you know, and being a real the horror, you know, a horror buff as well. I mean, I found that like, um, you know, I know that that it's for a distinguished competition, but I know that when I did the New Mutants with Chris Claremont and did like the, you know, the whole demon bear, uh, uh, you know, exploration and everything else, there were a lot of aspects that um, that I felt like. Uh, I, I was almost a little worried that that it would be um, uh, it was at, like there was a level of abstraction and, and kind of pushing and getting in under kind of getting in under the skin that I felt like uh, well I guess it, it echoes for me what everybody else was saying about can we get away with this it's like um, I've done a couple of things I remember there was one there was one cover that I did for a Joker uh, and I remember I came up with the idea. And um, and I just thought there's no way this is going to be used. It's it's it just it's impossible, and um, it's going to it's going to alienate viewers, and it's just not going to pass any kind of 
code whatsoever. And it was one scene where the, where the, uh, the Joker sort of got no shirt on, but he's holding up a heart and it's his, it's his heart, you know, and he's saying you missed, you know? Yeah. And like, um, and it was, I knew it wasn't going to be done, but I had to draw the image anyway. It's like I needed to kind of pur like it's like what David was saying about, you know, purging. It's like for me, like that level of catharsis of getting it out. And just um, so I find that that a good litmus test for me is when I'm talking to editors or working with with, you know, co uh, co creators is um, when I go, there's no way we can do this. It's like it, you almost have to kind of trust your instincts like that's the direction you should go. You know, in a weird way, it's like, OK, like, fo you know, follow through, follow through, because um, you end up finding out that things are um, there's a more of there's a universality to it. It might be it, it's exactly in some respects the right thing to do at the time is when you when you get that little bit of like, uh, I don't know if we can get away with this. And it's like, you know, I mean, I like with that cover, that yoga cover, I, I repurposed it in a different way. But the, the sentiment was still there. But at the same time, like I said, I needed to draw that image to kind of purge it from my psyche. No, I love hearing that. Believe me, I'm like, as, as an editor, I am always one to be like, I would rather that my creators go too far and then I have to pull them back as opposed to me having to Absolutely. push them yes. far enough. Yes. So I love hearing that from all of you. And uh, I know we've only got like another minute or two, um, and you guys were kind of talking about what scares you. We recently announced the DC Horror Line, and as all of you are horror fans here, what characters do you kind of want to see DC do horror with, or what kind of characters do you want to see us take a horror spin on? I know, Matt, you're kind of already handling a lot of that, <laughs> you and James. I mean, I, I would say just to, you know, not, to, not that my play is in full, but uh, I would love to see a Sergeant Rock horror book. That would be awesome. That's actually that's a great. You have idea. my phone number. Yeah, that's actually great. I'm just curious to see, uh, you know, what uh, what you're all going to do in general, because um, sometimes it's almost like the, there's a part of me that's going like sitting back and going, "Okay, surprise me." <laughs> you know, it's not like not like I'm trying to make anybody sort of like uh, have to uh, you know step up or anything like that. But it's it's like I I I just I trust the hands that, that, that this is up in. And I, I'm like, I, I, I'm looking forward to just being, uh, you know, surprised and, and creeped out, you know, in equal measure, you know, and that's my in, goal. In that's my goal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just sort of, as you know, from having worked with me now, I, I'm also, you know, I, I, I have a, a big nostalgia kick. You know, so so you know, any time we could ever revisit uh, the House of Mysteries and Secrets is is fine by me. You know, I I I I, I love seeing them uh, incorporated into uh, Justice League Dark. Um, but you know, to that that sort of that whole anthology vibe is you know, I I, I for some reason I think uh, horror lends itself to that, um, and I think that's one of the reasons those those books persisted for so long. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I, I actually, I totally agree with you. I'm just thinking about what you just said about House Mystery and and, and it made me think of, of like shows like Night Gallery, et cetera, et cetera, you know, where, where the anthology format or Creepy and Eerie or any of those, it's where, um, where there's, uh, you know, kind of a core group that's sort of like, you know, the Crypt Keeper inviting you in kind of a thing and, and uh yeah, that that brings back so much fun, so many fond memories, and, and uh, um, it sort of sets the the table already, you know, for for in my head about what to expect. Like there was a kind of an excitement that when I used to read them, you know, about like, oh, great, we're, you know, here we go, you know. Then I I would definitely recommend picking up Are You Afraid of Dark Side, which is our horror anthology for October, um, and we get a little cheeky with it, which as you can tell nice. by the title. So, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, I know we're just about out of time. Is there anything else I missed? Anything else anyone wants to plug that I didn't say? I don't want to miss anything. No? Um, people should be reading uh, DC's uh, Joker Presents the Puzzle Box by yes. us, which has yes. horror elements. That's true. Uh, and a, and a Crypt Keeper-esque version of the Joker. 
That is very true. So yeah. Matt has done an amazing, amazing job crafting this insane mystery puzzle box thing. And I am so in love with it. And like, when I read the issues, I'm like, I cannot believe this is, this is turning out this way. And, and it's wonderful. I highly, highly recommend people reading that as well. Wow. Sounds creepy. Great. Well, guys, I just wanted to sincerely thank you from the bottom of my little horror heart for, for joining us and, and speaking about DC's horror projects, uh, what we've got going on, what's to come. Bill, David, Matt, Rex, you guys are all fantastic. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And well, uh, certainly, I had a wonderful time. It was great to see everybody. Great to see you, Katie. See and you um, I'm really, really excited. So, you know. Awesome. Here's Johnny, you know. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. And uh, we'll be here to scare you. <laughs>